Okay, so the purpose of the call, the, the talk is really to talk about uh, multi-cloud strategy, basically. And uh, what I wanted is really to go uh, actually to the end very quickly, uh, is to show the reality of what we're facing, which is, you know, there is different environments and cloud being an environment and not just a cloud. And also talk about multi-stack, which is, uh, if you like, the... Uh, the close brother of multi-cloud, which is a cloud in, its, uh, in itself is an environment, a data center environment, and there could be multiple environments for QA, for development. They might be in different clouds, they might not be in different clouds, they might be in different platforms like Kubernetes and others. You'll see that the strategy of doing multi-stack plus multi-cloud is not that different. At the end of the day, we do need a way to harmonize those environments. Uh, so that's kind of how I'm gonna run that. Um, so I'll start with a reality check. Okay, so I'll start with a quick definition of what is hybrid cloud and what we mean by that. Again, very quickly. So usually when we th people think about multi-cloud, they have a certain set of expectation in mind. Uh, normally not what is uh, presented here. So the, the most common use case is actually uh, future-proofing. Future-proofing means that I wanna be able to run on different clouds, but I'm not necessarily gonna practice it today. I wanna be able to be Agnostic because I want, I have the idea that in some day in the future, if I want to do that, I want to be able to do that. And that's future proofing, which is not less important. Assuming that it's not that complex, actually, uh, most people would want something like that. The other one is cloud portability. Usually, that's, uh, that fits to vendors. So I'm selling a product that uh, for enterprises, for example, and those enterprises may live in Azure or may live somewhere else. And I want my software to run on those different environments. In this case, the cloud happens to be a market, uh, very much like operating system. If we previously ported our application to Windows and to Mac, a Mac is a market, uh, a, a, a Linux is a market, and we want, we want our software to be available on all those. So for ISVs, this type of portability is important. Uh, another use case is multi-cloud uh, in a case where we have the same service or the same application spread it across multiple cloud environment. This is more, if you'd like, a case in which you'll run data services on Google and the compute services on Amazon. That's something that a lot of startups are doing today. Uh, but it could be any different environments uh, where you could have different private clouds. You're actually running on VMware right now on vCloud and you want to move to a public cloud, but you might also have an OpenStack environment talking to your VMware environment. So any type of diff two environments could be that type of uh, use case. And actually I mentioned the last one is the cloud bursting in which I want to I'm running on a certain environment and I want to borrow resources from another environment. And how do you do that in an on-demand fashion? That's what cloud bursting means. So the bottom line of that is really, it's multiple use cases of, of environments and how I interact with those environments. And I listed a couple of them, but actually there is even more than that. Uh, but for the sake of the discussion, I don't think that we need to go even further than that. How many people are using multi-cloud or running on multi-cloud, as I mentioned? Uh, the statistics show that it's not esoteric. Uh, actually, there is more and more people that don't even know at the organization level, not at the individual level. So if I'll ask an individual, you'll probably run on a certain cloud. But if I go into organization, the organization itself has multiple business units, multiple applications, and those tend to be running on different environments. So for at the organization level, you will find that the use of multiple cloud is even more uh, commonly used than it is on an individual basis. And that's why that question was answered in the way it was answered. And this was actually a survey that we did in Cloudify recently, and you could see the stats here. It uh, was a bit even surprising for us in the sense that uh, we do see clouds that we didn't expect to have that level of adoption uh, actually getting that. Uh, also, when we looked at other analysis by uh, other, if you like, markets, clearly Amazon is uh, very top at the market right now. Uh, but there is many still new clouds coming into the market. Alibaba, for example, in China. Uh, we also got Oracle with Bare Metal, so they're running a lot of their database and they're going to their own customers to do that. They bought Ravello, which is an Israeli company, uh, to run some of that stuff. And Salesforce is uh, doing a niche cloud, marketing cloud, all those sort of things. Uh, so when we look at that, you can understand that multi-cloud is more of an interesting kind of space right now. Also, when we talk about private cloud, usually we think about our old data center. This is no longer the case. Why it's no longer the case? I think it's pretty obvious. 
cloud became to the point, get go to the point where it's actually uh, ubiquitous enough that I can actually do a lot of the things that previously I could do only on my private data center. But that's no longer the case. I can actually uh, do almost everything in a public cloud environment, and it becomes private cloud really becomes more of a, a, a who control the cloud. Do I control those resources? Who control the data? Do I control the data? Where does that sit becomes less important. Not from a geographical perspective, but the operator that runs it could be Amazon, but it could still be private. I own the data, meaning that it's private. And therefore, what you could see is that there is concepts that are evolving from that uh, even further. So Amazon is doing something that is called VPC, which is the ability to extend your private cloud data center into public cloud and basically have the resources on the, pri on the public cloud act as if they're another node in your, in your current data center by the fact that they create this network overlay that allows you to do that. Azure actually came with Azure Stack recently, and that's also changing the market. They have a rack kind of machines that they can install in your data center, and that rack can talk to Azure, and all the control plane is still a service, but the actual data could live in your own data center, and that allows you that level of flexibility. So even when you talk about private cloud or hybrid cloud, uh, that world is very evolving right now and changing. Private cloud, uh, to continue on that line, private cloud companies that used to be very, very private cloud, Nokia, Cisco, all those guys, have recently, and when I'm saying recently, it's really the past few weeks, past few months, uh, have uh, announced partnership with public clouds because they also realized that what matters to them is not to own the data center, it's to own the data, it's to own the application. And if Amazon can provide the actual data center at a low cost, they would use that. And they strike partnership deals, different uh, type of partnerships to actually do that. So even when we're talking today on Cisco, or even VMware, VMware itself has a partnership on Amazon. They operate it, they run it, but they take the data center from Amazon. Everything else is a VMware kind of cloud. Similarly, we're seeing the same thing with Nokia and Cisco, and that's also changing. Uh, there is an important aspect to that, which actually simplify how we deal with hybrid cloud, because uh, what we're starting to see is that they're all starting to look the same. They're all starting to behave the same. They're all starting to even be on the same locations, as opposed to you know, a very different private cloud that we had today uh, to a very different public cloud that we had before. So now private and public becomes very similar. It's even running on the same data center. It's even operated by the same, if you'd like, operator. And it becomes more of an integration of two concepts than integration of completely different environments. And that's kind of the, uh, the other point that I wanted to make here. So things become even more interesting as we go to the edge. Now, I, uh, usually when we talk about edge, people don't think about cloud when you talk to the edge. And I see people here from the Army. I think you'll probably understand what I'm talking about right now. But edge devices, even your iPhone, is now becoming a mini cloud of itself. Right? It runs an operating system. It could even run containers within those devices, and which means that it's just another mini cloud. And therefore, it's just a version of the same cloud that we've seen, but very, very distributed, like millions of devices and stuff like that. And we want to be able to treat them as if they are running on a central cloud from a management perspective and other things. Uh, but the idea is that this type of heterogeneous type of environment, multi-cloud type of environment, becomes even more common as we move to an IoT use cases, uh, connected cars, and so forth and so forth. So well, the, 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 I think the reasons why we're seeing a lot of that is because of this. And this is something that I'm using a lot uh, in recent presentation. It's basically saying that the speed of innovation far exceeds the speed of adoption. The speed of adoption, this is kind of the more low. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. But the adoption cycle of adopting a technology haven't changed much over the past 20, 40 years even. But the speed in which new technologies are evolving have changed to a point where you could see that it's really exploding. And what that really leads us to a point in which organizations, especially large organizations, adopt new technologies, but they don't really replace one, the previous ones. So all of a sudden, what we end up with is something like this, where we are starting to see more and more silos in our environment, where each environment becomes a silo. 
And in our case of the presentation, an environment would be a cloud. So the way I would manage Azure would be different than the way I would manage AWS. And the way I would manage my private data center would be very different than any other data center. And if I extend it to a platform, Kubernetes versus non-Kubernetes environment, that would be the same thing. So the silo becomes a problem. Why is that a problem? Because simple questions cannot be answered even. How much it costs me to operate my cloud? Do I have access capacity? Do I have resources that are not well utilized and I can borrow them for other applications? Those things cannot be done in silos. And there are many, many things, security and so forth, that becomes very complex the more I have more and more of those silos. And because of the difference between the speed of innovation and the speed of adoption, that reality is going to be more and more severe. And that's why we see seeing organizations that previously could say, I'm an Oracle shop, I'm a VMware shop, an IBM shop. This doesn't work anymore. Uh, and that's something that really forces us to look into that differently. So what are the approaches that organizations do or use to solve that problem? Uh, I kind of put three categories. There is more, but I think those represent the main, the main solution or the main approaches, how we do that. Uh, so one of them is the classic, if you'd like, cloud management platform. When I'm saying classic, it's really a way to view the infrastructure in a glorified way, which means that uh, I can actually see the resources from Amazon and the resources from Azure on the same dashboard. It's kind of a single pane of glass model. I have the same way to do chargebacks and all those sort of things. And there is advantage and disadvantage there. I'll talk more about it. But it really touches that layer. Then we have the platforms. Today, I could say that all of the platform, all the past platform, are running with Kubernetes, so uh, it's no longer Kubernetes as a microservices type of approach versus PaaS, which is doing something different. It's actually the same thing. Uh, and PaaS becoming an abstraction on top of Kubernetes. And we also have an automation and orchestration approach, which is really, don't change your environment, let's talk about automation, how we automate the processes across those different environments, and uh, I think you'll see how those things are combined. So a couple of things about the platform, is the, the uh, CMP as they're called, the, the uh, cloud management platforms. Again, the main thing that is a benefit for them is the cost and the single pane of glass. You get one dashboard, you see all the clouds as if it was one big cloud. The disadvantage is that it's uh, very limited to management of infrastructure, so it has no application awareness or very little application awareness, meaning that if you need to do DevOps cycles and other processes, then things becomes a little bit more complex. If you want to use cloud services like EMR, RDS, and others that are part of any clouds, it's not that trivial to use them under the credential because in many cases they would run on the cloud under their own credential. And therefore, your, the credential of using those platforms is very different than the credential that you're going to use when you access the cloud. And usually you wouldn't have even the access to view those instances that are running by those platforms. Um, so those are, I would say, some of the limitations that you would see there. So there is some value here. There is a big promise here. But I b personally believe that uh, the, the value is, is very limited. The other that becomes more popular is using containers and platform as a service, which is very application-centric on the other. It's, it's like almost the 180% of what I described earlier. It's really focusing on the application and making the application portable across different clouds, not trying to view the VMs. The VM itself, you could still go to those clouds and see the VMs as if you're running it yourself. The, the platform really abstracts how you operate the application. And so you deploy the application. And because many of the clouds support Kubernetes today and containers, uh, it actually makes the portability of this type of application and workload uh, something that is much more manageable and easier than it used to be before. Uh, so that's something that is become, and that's why it's becoming very, very popular because it's not just a single pane of glass, it's actually supported by different clouds and now all the clouds have the same, if you like, code base of that platform and therefore you could expect that the behavior between those clouds would be more similar. The other, uh, 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 if you like, solutions is the automation layers. The automation really, doesn't really abstract the, the clouds. It's abstracting away. But what it tries to do is really provide you that single uh, control plane, not single pane of glass, single control plane, meaning that you could have resources from different kinds, network, Kubernetes, and other things, and you could automate the process of how you run it in one cloud and use certain language to abstract that so that the automation would work pretty much in the same way on another cloud. But the actual resource that it's gonna touch and the actual 
uh, if you like, uh, infrastructure that it's going to touch can be very different. So that gives you a, a higher degree of abstraction as opposed to CMP, meaning that the abstraction is really on the demand, how you define what you want, what you need to run, versus how you're going to run that. And how you're going to run that, that's something that is going to happen more in runtime, and I'll talk to, to you about it in just one second. So by now, you need to be very confused, as most people are. Most organizations are because there are many solutions. And as I mentioned, in the speed of uh, adoption versus speed of innovation, every day, every conference, you're going to hear about the next thing that is going to solve that problem and going to be better than the previous one. And because you're not able to adopt at that speed where those solutions are coming to market, you're going to look at that and basically take a position, uh, a standing base, basically position of not taking a decision and looking around saying, okay, if I don't take a decision, probably I'm going to get the next solution that is going to be better than this one. So I'll probably wait, like most people do. Uh, but that's also a problem, as you probably uh, assume. And therefore, and that's kind of, I would say, the main uh, point of my presentation. How do we operate in this type of environment? So the first thing is the only constant is change. You could see it on my shirt. That's something that we believe strongly is that you need to build a solution and a strategy that is not bounded to a cloud or a platform or a, a stack. You need to build it in a way that you assume that the next thing that you're going to deploy is not something that you know today. It's going to be something different. So it needs to be flexible enough and you need to have that flexibility in mind, that pluggability in mind, to adopt to new things that you don't know that exist yet. How does that work? I'll, I'll talk to you in a second, but that's a very important concept on how you design anything in this type of environment. Because if, you, if your strategy, like many others, are saying, okay, I'll let you on Kubernetes, guess what? Two years ago, it was Cloud Foundry, and that changed. And three years ago, it was something else, and that changed. So that is not sustainable. The next thing is really uh, uh, the keep your option open. I'll talk more about it. It sounds like a buzzword, but, uh, but I'll show you how you can actually do that practically without too much cost. So what we kind of look into that is, is uh, the way to abstract between the demand and the supply. The demand being the application. This is what you describe in your script, in your blueprint. You describe how the application uh, is comprised, what the component that needs to be, and then you expect you know, the, the platform or the environment itself to do the matchmaking between the demand and the supply itself. And that gives you a lot of flexibility because I'm not tying the demand to a specific, I'm not bounding it to a specific platform. And at any point of time, I could say that same demand can be served by Azure, by OpenStack, by Google, by something else, but the definition of that demand doesn't have to change. Uh, in, in many cases, it will be the same because most of it touches my application not the underlying resources that serve that application. So that gives me a much greater degree of flexibility, and that's something that uh, I think is important in that context. Um, the other thing to, to note about it is that uh, um, the pluggability really allows you to plug the resources that you want to plug into that environment as a plugin. So I can extend the resources that I want to have very easily. I can have uh, Azure, or I can have OpenStack, but I can have different services within Azure. Basically, AP, every API endpoint. It doesn't limit you to the infrastructure layer. I can expose anything that has an API as a pluggable resource that I, that I can script and talk to and have it as part of my resource. I'll show you later, if I'll have time, how that looks like. To make it real, what I used is an example of an application, a very complex application. I'll, I call it an application, even though it's an infrastructure in itself. Uh, it's called ONAP. It's a very big project in Linux Foundation. I'm not going to go into the details of what is ONAP because it's not the point. The point is really to take an application that is relatively uh, uh, new. And it's very complex, as you can see. It has dozens of microservices, and most of it is running at Kubernetes. So the first thing was to use Kubernetes as a strategy to do this multi-cloud. That's fine. Okay? We can, if we can run on Kubernetes, Kubernetes gives us that portability. And uh, at least 50% of our problems goes away just by doing that. And, and really, as you can see there, uh, this is kind of uh, the approach that we've taken there. The second point is that we want to be able to run Kubernetes in different environments, whether it's our cloud or, or different clouds. And therefore, we needed that same uh, blueprint that I mentioned earlier as a way to describe the Kubernetes instance. 
And if I can describe it in a way that it could run on Azure, on OpenStack, on any environment in the way that I want it to run, then I can get a very easy portability of the Kubernetes cluster itself. Uh, I can also say, run on an existing instance of Kubernetes. And, and, the, and that's uh, where we plug in another layer of that. So in that case, what I'm doing is I'm automating the, uh, the services by talking to Kubernetes itself. So I'm taking a bunch of microservices and I'm templatizing them. And now I'm talking to Kubernetes as if it was the end cloud, as if it was the actual target cloud that I'm talking to. The, the only difference is that now the API that I'm going to talk about is microservices API and not a VM API. And I'm going to deploy microservices and not VM. But from an orchestration perspective, it's going to be pretty much the same. I'm basically automating a deployment of application. I'm taking processes and resources. In this case, those resources happens to be microservices and pods. And now I'm comprising them together, automating that process. And the endpoint that I'm going to talk to is Kubernetes. So far, so good. And that gives me the ability to take that gigantic list of microservices and automate the process, templatizing it, and deploy it on Kubernetes itself. And I can have multiple instances of that and so forth. I can have discovery between them and all those things. So orchestration and Kubernetes actually works hand in hand. So I actually took two buckets of things that we mentioned, and I'm actually combining them together, and together they give me a very flexible solution. The other thing that it gives me is not just orchestrating of services on Kubernetes. Because the orchestration layer that I described earlier in the previous slide can manage artifacts on Kubernetes, but it's not bounded to Kubernetes. It's generic enough so that I can actually point it to any resource. I can have a hybrid stack solution in which some of the resources would run on Kubernetes and would talk to other resources that runs outside of Kubernetes. And reality is such that in many cases, that's going to be your reality. Your database is going to be something that is not that easy to convert into a Kubernetes instance, even though technically you could do that. But sometimes it's not easy to do that, it's not even the right thing to do from an effort versus value perspective. And therefore what you want is still uh, an end-to-end -end automation where you could actually deploy the entire thing uh, in one click and be able to run it. So how does it work? It really works in the sense that if I have the orchestration layer on top that is agnostic to the platform, I can have that flexibility. And if you remember the previous bullet uh, uh, that I mentioned, that you want to be able to use those platforms, but in a way that doesn't lock you to those platforms, that layer of orchestration really gives me that flexibility. I can work with Kubernetes. I can use everything in Kubernetes, but I'm not bounded to Kubernetes. I can still combine it with other things. And that's a much more robust strategy to allow me to do this type of hybrid stack and hybrid cloud type of environment. Now, if I stretch it to multiple environments, then what we could see is that even when I'm using Kubernetes, again, I can run Kubernetes in different environments. That could be public, private, bare metal, non-bare metal. That could be QA, production, multiple sites, uh, multiple geography, uh, multiple clouds, all those type of environments. So if I abstract how I run Kubernetes through this type of orchestration there, I can then point that type of environment and be flexible on, on the instance of a Kubernetes that I want to run in different ways. And I can say, for development, run uh, Kubernetes in a relatively low-cost setup, which is not highly available, and not necessarily the high-end machines, and so forth and so forth. For the production environment, to take the high-end type of resource pools and, and use them to do those type of things. And I want to do that in a way that I can actually even create the environment, run it, kill it, and recreate it in an easy way. And that's kind of uh, the point that I'm uh, making. The same idea is on multiple sites. The same idea would apply to uh, uh, also uh, bare metal and non-bare metal type of environments and edge device or non-edge device, as I mentioned, I think, earlier. Because I don't have a lot of time, I'm actually going to show you that snippet very quickly here. I have less than five minutes to show it. So what you could see here is that I'm spawning Kubernetes. And then uh, after I'll spawn Kubernetes, the important thing would be how I can describe a microservice on that Blueprint service that will talk to that Kubernetes instance. Okay, so in this case, what you could see is a, it's a YAML file. The model itself is called Tosca. It's a standard language for this type of Blueprint. And what I'm adding is another Blueprint, another microservice. That microservice 
is going to be able to, in this case it's called an on-app application, but it's just an application, a service. And I'm going to say that it needs to run on a certain, it's, an, it's a Kubernetes application, and now I'm putting references that says, run on this Kubernetes master. And obviously I'm providing some other context information to do that. There is another node that already have reference to a Kubernetes master, so it already knows the location and, and those type of things. This allows me uh, to provide that level of abstraction that that same blueprint would run on any Kubernetes instance because there is nothing there that points to a specific instance. It actually derives a lot of that information on runtime. And therefore the blueprint itself is fairly abstracted from the actual runtime environment. And that gives me the flexibility. So what you could see is that I could actually point that and say, use that service template, the Kubernetes service template, to actually run that service. And it will talk to the Kubernetes API. And in this case, I can actually uh, say, have that service even contained in a certain node or a certain pod to actually run it. But the, the, but the general idea is that when I have that scripting layer on top, I can actually have that flexibility. And because, as I mentioned earlier, if that scripting language can be something that can be abstracted from Kubernetes itself, I can also do the same thing, not just with Kubernetes services. I can actually attach services that are not Kubernetes services on the same control plane. So that same blueprint can have MariaDB running outside of Kubernetes and a microservice running on Kubernetes and connect them together. And that's how I get that flexibility that I mentioned earlier. So what am I saying here? So you can see that the application this is actually all the microservices that I created, and those microservices are now running. But again, I'll... So the bottom line of all that is that if you recall the principle that I mentioned earlier and how you do it with Hybrid Cloud, I mentioned three buckets. One of them was CMP, which gives me the single pane of glass. I mentioned containers, which is Kubernetes, which gives me uh, the spotable workload that I can run on multiple clouds. And I mentioned orchestration, which is really taking the automation-first approach. So it's infrastructure-first approach, application-first approach, and automation-first approach. The solution that we've taken in this specific example was to combine two elements, the orchestration-first approach plus the application-first approach, which means I'm taking Kubernetes to abstract the way I deploy the application, and I'm taking orchestration layer to do this across multiple clouds and across multiple stacks, where I can connect services that doesn't run in Kubernetes and connect them to Kubernetes. In this case, I can actually extend on what I'm already getting from Kubernetes and do things that are more practical because many organizations would have a problem to achieve all the benefit that they get from Kubernetes uh, where the first step is really move everything to Kubernetes. That's going to be a much harder task for a lot of organizations to say, hey, Kubernetes gives you all of that, but in order to benefit from that, forget all the things that you have and now move everything to here. It's going to take a long time and in some cases it doesn't even make sense because some of those services, as I mentioned, data services and other things, are not necessarily things that are worthwhile the effort to actually move them. They might even be retarded at some point in the process. So with that type of approach, we have the flexibility. Now, more importantly, as I mentioned earlier, it's also future-proof. Future-proof in the sense that there's also services that won't run Kubernetes, not because they're legacy or data services, because they're serverless. And because they're the next thing that we don't necessarily even know, but will be there very soon. And that allows me to be ready to accept that and don't change it again and again and again and move everything to the next thing and, and find myself really doing this lift and shift type of processes all the time and continuously and never get to the point where every, uh, I have a stable version that I can work with. So this gives me the ability to do that in a more evolvable way. And it's something that I can do gradually and extend my system and extend my application over time and use those new services, but also connect to my uh, other services and still benefit from things like Kubernetes in this type of context. Uh, so that's kind of the, the main point that I wanted to mention here. Okay, thank you.